Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. There are 7,000 of you, in fact, more than 7,000 of you from over 100 countries. And a very warm welcome to all of you uh, to the second session of the World Sepsis Congress Spotlight on Maternal and Neonatal Sepsis. We had an excellent first session uh, on some of the key challenges relating to maternal and neonatal sepsis. In this session, we will shine a spotlight on maternal sepsis, the third commonest killer of mothers. We have five very eminent speakers who will cover a range of subjects, starting with such fundamentals as the definition of sepsis to prevention and management of sepsis. You will also hear about some really exciting new research work that aims to address maternal sepsis comprehensively. Each speaker has about 15 minutes, and I hope there will be time for some questions at the end of each talk and some time at the end of the session for questions and discussions. So let's get started. The first talk is on the challenges, burden, definition, and identification of maternal sepsis. And this is, uh, will be given by Joao Paulo, Professor Joao Paulo. Uh, so Joao Paulo trained as an obstetrician and gynecologist with a specialization in intensive care medicine with extensive experience in global health. Joao Paulo worked also as a professor of social medicine at the University of Sao Paulo. Joao Paulo is based at the Department of Reproductive Health and Research at the World Health Organization. Over to you, Joao Paulo. Greetings from Geneva. Thank you, uh, Ari. And um, uh, thank you for the participants, for your um, audience. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about the challenges, the burden, and the definition and identification of maternal sepsis. And this is uh, starting by the burden. Uh, I need to, to remember you all that every year there is an estimated number of 303,000 maternal deaths taking place around the world. About 25% or more of these deaths are related to maternal sepsis. And I want to uh, use some of my time to explore a little bit the, the burden. So we have about 11% of all maternal deaths that are the, where the underlying cause is infection or sepsis. And that represents about 35,000 um, maternal deaths every year that are initiated by an infectious uh, condition that evolves into sepsis. But we have another, uh, an estimate of, uh, that can uh, reach to up to 100,000 maternal deaths in total, where other causes, they uh, appear as the underlying condition and they evolve into sepsis and then a maternal death. So here I have one example. For instance, there is a case, a, mater, a, a woman that develops the postpartum hemorrhage, then evolves into hypovolemic shock. She receives uh, adequate resuscitation, but still uh, develops a bacterial translocation, and then days later sepsis, and eventually 
these women who die of sepsis. We could think of uh, uh, different examples related to uh, hypertension, for instance, where the primary cause is uh, a hypertensive disorder that evolves into a complication, for instance, a stroke, for example, and then uh, aspirative pneumonia, sepsis, and then death. So the total burden of uh, sepsis related to, to, to pregnancy is estimated to be around 100,000 maternal deaths every year. And there are some important challenges that need to be addressed if we want to tackle this uh, burden, if we want to alleviate this uh, burden. The first one is that sepsis, as you know, it's a very heterogeneous condition. Different signs and symptoms can be associated with sepsis. Sepsis during pregnancy and among young adults, which is um, frequently the case among pregnant women, can be difficult to recognize. And when it becomes evident, sepsis in that population may be already in uh, severe and then uh, advanced with a reduced um, chance of survival. So it's very important for us to uh, develop ways and our knowledge and our technology to be able to identify sepsis as soon as uh, it's possible, as soon as uh, it can be feasible, its identification. We had also an, an update in terms of definition. If you, if you recall from the previous session that this has been already mentioned, and we will uh, go back to this issue, is that in 2016, uh, there is a new sepsis definition that has been proposed for the general population by the third international consensus on sepsis and sept shock. In this new definition, the importance of systemic inflammation has been reduced and uh, there is uh, an increased focus on organ dysfunction. So in a way, we are talking now in terms of identifying sepsis. It's an, an infection that evolves with an organ dysfunction, or if you prefer, an organ dysfunction that developed in, in, a, in, a, in a patient with infection. Based on this new definition, uh, we need to, to consider that pregnancy was not part of the, the works or it was not considered in depth when the sepsis tree consensus was prepared. So the maternal and physiological changes during pregnancy and the postpartum period, uh, they make the diagnosis of sepsis more complicated and obviously this can have an impact in the way we are going to identify sepsis cases. And on the, from the other side, there are different definitions and concepts that are related to maternal se sepsis currently in use when we think of obstetrics or midwifery and maternal health. We are familiar with endometritis, we are familiar with um, uh, poor pro-sepsis, uh, uh, septic abortions, for instance. So there are different conditions that uh, are related to sepsis, but uh, there, so far there was not one single unifying definition that is also up to date with the current understanding of um, maternal sepsis or of sepsis in general. So there is uh, WHO started them to develop um, a definition on maternal sepsis. Uh, and here you are seeing the results of a systematic review and an expert consultation. Uh, all the published literature and uh, WHO documents were reviewed. There was a multidisciplinary international panel of experts that was consulted through an online surveys and in-person meetings. And there, uh, the, the definition that was product of this process um, 
is maternal sepsis is a life-threatening condition defined as organ dysfunction resulting from infection during pregnancy, childbirth, postpartum, or post-abortion post -abortion period. So that is a definition that has been proposed by WHO in 2016 uh, as a result of um, an extensive systematic review and consultation process in order to get it aligned with the new definition. There is also a statement on maternal sepsis um, that uh, recognizes the need to foster new thinking and catalyze greater action to address this important cause of maternal mortality. And the idea is that this definition where we put infection plus organ dysfunction resulting in maternal se sepsis is also an actionable definition. So uh, the importance of uh, early uh, recognition of the condition, the immediate use of fluids and providing hemodynamic support, antibiotics, monitoring, referral, and addressing also the, the source. We will see more of details of this condition um, as, uh, as the, the series of presentations uh, evolve. In terms of identification, it is uh, still uh, WHO is working in very clear and simple to use practice-oriented practice identification criteria, but I think it's important for all of us to, very, very, to have very clear in our minds that whenever we have a suspected or confirmed infection, we should uh, also look for uh, organ dysfunction that can be just in the suspicion or in a confirmation. And also, uh, whenever we have uh, abnormal vital signs or laboratory exams, and whenever we see a, 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 pa a patient, a pregnant woman that's not looking very uh, well, look, looks unwell, we should uh, really think of uh, sepsis. So sepsis can be a hidden cause uh, that is motivating some atypical uh, conditions and uh, manifestations of organ dysfunction, even when we don't have um, uh, infection very clearly uh, presented. To address this, uh, WHO and uh, a number of uh, other organizations uh, have started the Global Maternal Neonatal Sepsis Initiative that is actually um, organizing this um, event, this uh, fantastic uh, World Sepsis Congress Spotlight. Um, so we have different organizations, uh, particularly the Global Sepsis Alliance. And as uh, in order to, to finish my presentation as a take-home message, I want to, to re-emphasize the importance of sepsis as one of the main causes of maternal death. So there is a, a new definition of maternal sepsis. The concept is an infection plus organ dysfunction during pregnancy, childbirth, postpartum, post-abortion. Uh, this very important message that you see repeated um, uh, now and again, uh, that to stop sepsis, we need to think sepsis, and that the Global Maternal and Neonatal uh, Sepsis Initiative is a collaboration that from different organizations to accelerate the reduction of preventable maternal and neonatal deaths related to sepsis. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention, and I'm happy to take um, uh, questions and comments. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Joao Paulo, for a very clear presentation. I think it's great to have a definition that we can work with, and I think this will be an absolute bedrock on which we can build. Uh, we have a few questions from the audience. Uh, if I may put one or two of those to you, please. Uh, the first is, um, are there any new technologies or clinical decision support tools that you think would be useful in recognition and management of sepsis, even in the context of less developed countries? Yes, and one of the technologies that we can think of hard technology, like technology for detection of lactate, uh, which there are some bad side um, uh, devices that are being developed and put into market, there are possibilities of using uh, pulse oximetry and try to uh, develop uh, new devices. And there is w work being done to do that at a low cost. Uh, 
But I think what I want really to emphasize, the main technology that we would like to, to stress in this presentation and in this opportunity is uh, more of a, a behavioral change. And um, particularly if you start think, thinking of sepsis whenever you see cases that may be atypical, uh, that you can uh, have a, a, it's not very clear, they need to think very promptly and early on sepsis. And something that we would like to emphasize as well is when you systematize the, the approach um, for addressing sepsis through bundles of care. For instance, we know uh, about bundles for developed uh, countries, but also there are new bundles and developments that are being uh, done, targeting uh, low resource settings. And uh, our next speaker um, will uh, also certainly address this issue, and I will leave for him the details. But I, I want to um, really emphasize that is more of a cultural um, approach that we have to have in the organizations. That is, whenever we have a case of infection or a typical case uh, of an organ dysfunction, we need to think of sepsis um, very uh, promptly. Great. Thank you. There is a question relating to guidelines. Are there any guidelines that people can use at the moment while WHO uh, and partners are working up newer materials? Yes. Uh, WHO has released in uh, about uh, two years ago a guideline on maternal sepsis, uh, in fact, maternal infections uh, around uh, pregnancy and childbirth, and this has been published, and we can, I will post in the um, in the website of the Congress, the link to that. So yes, right. there is. Joe Paulo, thank you so much for the clear presentation, and we very much hope that you would be able to stay on for the final discussion. So we will move on to the second talk uh, in this second session. So this is uh, on prevention and management of maternal sepsis. And this talk is by David Lissauer from the University of Birmingham. So Dr. David Lissauer is a clinical lecturer in maternal and fetal medicine at the University of Birmingham. Uh, he divides his time between clinical work and research work. His research focuses on the challenges of maternal and fetal infections and how the maternal immune system adapts for successful pregnancy. So he has a, a combination of laboratory-based and clinical research. He has worked as an obstetrician in Malawi, so he has first-hand experience, and he has just recently completed the AIMS trial, uh, which investigated the prevention of infection after miscarriage surgery in Malawi, Tanzania, Uganda, and Pakistan. Uh, David is also a member of the WHO Technical Working Group on Maternal Sepsis and is leading the development of FASTM, which we will hear about in a moment. Over to you, David. Thank you very much, Ari, for the introduction, and uh, thank you for the invitation to talk at this fantastic Congress. I'm going to speak today on the prevention and management of maternal sepsis. So first, really before we start, I think we should recognize that a vast majority of the burden of maternal sepsis, mortality and morbidity, lies, of course, in low-income countries. And I think we need to, um, those of us not working there day by day, need to put ourselves into a labor ward of a typical busy district hospital in sub-Saharan Africa and remember what things are like. Here we have multiple women in labor taking their turns to access the labor trolleys with the chitenji, the cloth they brought from home. Midwives and clinicians busily in attendance moving from woman to woman, assessing them, carrying out examinations, conducting deliveries, procedures. In the labor ward, the equipment and resources may be scarce, need to be used sparingly. The power and water potentially is intermittent. The sink may be in the corner, but is it working? Is there something to dry one's hands? Is there soap there? I think if we place ourselves in that labor ward, the reason for the huge burden of sepsis in this environment is clear. 
the challenges to the patients and the practitioners working there is clear too. But also the great potential, as um, Professor Liz Molyneux said, where there's this great potential to really improve care and outcomes. So with these complex circumstances, we really need a concerted and coordinated approach combating the issues of infection prevention, seeking to better monitor women with infections or detect deterioration early, um, and then, of course, improve the management of sepsis itself to reduce mortality and morbidity. And that's what I'll briefly discuss here. So before talking of the medical interventions, I think it's critical to acknowledge the importance and the terrible state of water sanitation and hygiene in many facilities and how this underlies the challenges of infection prevention. Shockingly, one in five facilities worldwide lack appropriate toilets. One in three facilities don't have water within 500 meters and less than one in three have hand washing facilities with soap. And hand hygiene isn't just limited by infrastructure. In all settings, the challenges of staffing, the time we have available as clinicians and our compliance are additional barriers. But there are existing successful programs like the WHO multimodal hand hygiene approach that have shown promise to overcome these barriers and have been successfully implemented in resource limited settings. So moving on uh, to medical interventions, and these are the guidelines around infection prevention that Jao Paolo just referred to. The WHO guidelines on prevention and management of maternal peripartum infections. We're very fortunate these are excellent evidence-based guidelines published in 2015 where they took a very robust approach, engaging with a broad range of stakeholders, doing 24 systematic reviews, and coming up with 20 key recommendations, some of which are summarized above. The crucial messages were that vaginal cleansing is recommended prior to cesarean section, though there's uncertainty regarding the right agent to be used. And other key recommendations on antibiotic prophylaxis. Crucially, it shouldn't be being given routinely for birth, but should be being reserved for use prior to skin incision at cesarean section. For women having manual removal of the placenta or for women with severe tears where the uh, anal sphincter has been involved or penetration to the to within the rectum. In spite of this um, evidence-based guidance, um, it's incomplete because there's large evidence gaps, even surrounding common procedures and circumstances. And as we've heard earlier in the, the session, the other challenge is the gap between this evidence of based practice and what has been observed being implemented on the ground. And again, real opportunities here where we can improve care um, by devising practical uh, ways of helping the people better implement these key recommendations. So an example of our work trying to close one of these evidence gap was the AIMS trial. Despite miscarriage surgery being one of the commonest surgical procedures with pelvic infection, and uh, progression to sepsis, a serious complication, there was no evidence to guide practice regarding prevention of pelvic infection and whether they should or shouldn't receive antibiotic prophylaxis. So we've just completed the trial, randomizing 3,400 women, um, and we're awaiting the results. Um, but I hope that with this renewed global focus on sepsis and sepsis prevention, Within maternal health, there's going to be more opportunities to identify and close these evidence gaps 
um, to make sure that we are using antibiotics wisely and preventing infection wherever possible. So moving on past infection prevention to better detection of maternal sepsis. We've heard about the work being done on definitions and considering the unique physiology of pregnancy to improve our detection of maternal sepsis. But underlying this is what we and others have consistently observed in audits of practice, which is that observations are inconsistently performed and in many facilities only done on admission or incompletely. Um, and in addition to observations, there are limitations on further investigations that can be conducted and overall a failure to recognize uh, deterioration of mothers. There are a number of approaches that people are using. Some are technology-based approaches like the low-cost vital signs alert device um, which measures blood pressure, pulse, and gives a traffic light indicator based on shock index to guide people's care being tested in the Cradle 2 trial, and other more high-tech solutions, app-based mobile approaches. Our work with the Global Sepsis Alliance, um, the WHO, and others is on a, a sophisticated but low-tech solution centered around um, a modified early warning chart that many of you will be familiar with. This is an approach widely adopted in high-income countries. It's been adapted for a maternal population using cutoffs where values have been based on existing systematic reviews of the physiological changes in pregnancy and we hope will be further um, adapted as more information comes from the GLOSS study um, that Mercedes will speak about shortly. We're currently testing the use of this chart in 16 sites in Malawi to hopefully further adapt it um, uh, and improve it. Um, but it's been extremely well received so far. The concept behind it is that practitioners are guided by the color coding of red flags indicating abnormal observations that in the context of maternal infection indicate suspected sepsis and that then means that they can immediately initiate action in the form of a, a sepsis bundle. Um, we hope this, this empowers staff to act and to act quickly um, to escalate or to initiate the, the bundle appropriately. Alongside the chart, um, the decision tool um, here can guide people through that decision-making process, um, giving them indications of when a sepsis bundle, such as the fast end bundle, should be started or when care should be escalated. In the final part of the presentation, I want to talk about maternal sepsis management itself. We know from studies in non-pregnant adults in high-income countries that the use of sepsis bundles improves care and reduces mortality. The bundles, by bringing together the key actions, make it easy for clinicians to consistently deliver the right care to every patient in a timely way. And there are excellent, well-established sepsis bundles and comprehensive programs, um, as we all know, being operated in, in high-income countries. But none of these bundles were developed specifically for the maternal context, and the existing international recommendations aren't feasible in a low-income setting. In particular, our surveys of maternal health facilities demonstrate components such as blood culture and lactate very rarely available, but core components of existing uh, bundles. So we've been working with the Global Sepsis Alliance, the World Health Organization, um, JAPIGO and other partners to develop an appropriate sepsis bundle 
specifically for a maternal population designed for use in a low-income country and where it can be initiated both at a health centre where most women present and also in a hospital. We've gone through a robust uh, development process engaging in systematic reviews, uh, international modified Delphi process with 120 practitioners from more than 30 low-income countries, um, and then triangulated the findings with an expert panel. We then went on to operationalize this through practitioner workshops and are currently testing it on the ground um, across these 16 sites in Malawi. So this is an example um, of the treatment bundle that goes along with the training program as a physical piece of paper and aid memoir for practitioners to use. And this highlights the key components that this process developed of the FASTEM bundle. So FASTEM stands for fluids, antibiotics, source identification and control, transport and monitoring, both of mother and of the baby. We really hope that with this collaborative, comprehensive approach to maternal sepsis um, and introducing these practical tools to help people operationalize the guidance in their own clinical practice that we can um, make a difference in the care they can give. I'd just like to thank the many partners who are contributing uh, towards the program and um, would be keen to uh, get in contact with uh, uh, anyone via email or Twitter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. It's uh, very exciting to hear about the development of FAST-M. Uh, as you mentioned, timely treatment uh, to the right patients, uh, which is great. Um, we have question, uh, time for some questions if you would be willing to take them. Uh, so the first um, of these, uh, David, there is a question about um, the evidence uh, for antibiotic use for termination of pregnancy, cesarean section, and episiotomy. Yeah. So um, uh, there is good evidence for the use of antibiotics in reducing pelvic infection um, at termination of pregnancy. Um, and there's a, a, a systematic review we ourselves uh, conducted regarding this. Um, and there is a convincing and consistent evidence that antibiotic use in that context reduces infection. Um, this is a, a, a different patient cohort and a, a different procedure to miscarriage surgery. And that's really where the evidence gap existed. Um, similarly, there's uh, a number of Cochrane reviews that have uh, uh, examined the evidence regarding antibiotic use at cesarean section. And I think the key thing that has been brought out in the new guidance is the importance of giving antibiotics prior to skin incision um, and that they, um, there's no additional benefit in giving prolonged courses of antibiotics but a, a single uh, cephalosporin um, prior to skin incision. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, there was a third context, episiotomy. So, um, uh, this is another um, uh, evidence gap at a simple episiotomy um, or for instrumental deliveries. Um, there isn't uh, strong evidence of benefit of antibiotic use, and in that context, um, it's not currently recommended. Thank you, David. A quick answer to, to this question, uh, if you could, please. Uh, can we, uh, the question is, what's the role of QSOFA uh, in, in relation to maternal sepsis? So I, I, a, a great question, um, and I think the answer was previously also covered by um, Professor Comrade Reinhardt. And um, the reason we took the approach of using a modified early warning score system um, was because we felt this encouraged a comprehensive assessment of the patient, 
tracking of their observations graphically over time and that this was the the easiest way to integrate it into people's routine clinical care and this has been widely used so um uh QSO for itself there weren't any um uh uh women included in the cohort where it was devised and we wait eagerly to to hear if there's more evidence of what exactly the right thresholds and cutoffs should be for um diagnosis of suspected and confirmed sepsis Thank you very much, David. David, we hope that you can stay on for the final uh, discussion. Uh, so we will move on to the third talk of the second session. Uh, this is on management of maternal sep uh, septic shock. And this talk will be given by Maria Fernanda Escobar Bidate, who is a representative for Latin America at the FIGO Committee for Safe Motherhood and Newborn Health. Uh, originally from Colombia, she trained in obstetrics and gynecology and completed her clinical uh, epidemiology master's at the University de la Frontera in Chile, as well as a fellowship uh, in critical care and intensive care medicine at the University of Pittsburgh in the United States. Currently, she is the chief physician at the obstetric ICU and obstetric and gynecology service in Foundation Valley del uh, Lily in Colombia. Over to you, Maria. Hi. Good Hi. morning, everybody. Um, I will talk about the management of septic shock in pregnancy. The objectives of uh, this conference is to determine the definition and the main aspects of management of septic shock during pregnancy. Septic shock is defined as a subset of sepsis in which underlying circulatory and cellular metabolism abnormalities are profound enough to substantially increase mortality. This definition is according to the third international consensus definition of 2006. Adult patients with septic shock can be identified with a clinical construct of sepsis with persistent hypotension requiring vasopressors to maintain a mean arterial pressure of 65 millimeters of mercury and having a serum lactate level more than 2 millimoles per liter despite adequate volume resuscitation. With this criteria, hospital mortality is in excess of 40%. But this clinical definition has many different positions against the world because uh, one of the problems is related with the high specificity and the applicability just for hospitalized patients. Now, we will discuss important aspects in septic shock management. In the absence of evidence-based pregnancy-specific management recommendation for septic shock, it is probably advisable to follow general management guidelines. The guidelines developed by the Surviving Sepsis Program can be used as a basis for the treatment of the pregnant women with severe sepsis and septic shock, although the obstetric population was not specifically Consider during the establishment of the guidelines and doesn't have provisions that consider the physiology changes during pregnancy. The clinician should also assess fetal viability as resuscitation and definitive management proceed. The first step in the management of sepsis in obstetric is the use of the so-called resuscitation bundle. This step should be accomplished as soon as possible at within the first six hours. I will review specific changes of bundles related with septic shock. In the hour zero, the principal aim is to determine the severity of illness using a perfusion indicator. In situ, hypoxia lactate is overproduced by increased anaerobic glycolysis. Lactate clearance cannot overcome lactate production and may be worsened during critically ill status. A certain lactate level more than 2 millimoles per liter has been used like an emerging vital sign of septic shock. Lactate clearance 
at a discrete time point is an important prognostic factor compared to initial serum lactic level in severe sepsis. Some patients recovering from septic shock show normalized serum lactic levels, although vasopressors are still necessary to maintain a mean arterial pressure of 65 or greater. Additionally, decreased or normalized lactate levels are important signs of recovery from septic shock. These clinical findings support that serum lactate level is a more sensitive viral sign reflecting anaerobic metabolism and acidosis that blood pressure. There are few studies published, uh, published related with lactic acid in pregnant population. In the retrospective cohort of pregnant and postpartum patients with signs of sepsis, elevated lactic acid was associated with adverse maternal outcomes from this presumed sepsis. One important conclusion was a one millimole per liter increase in serum lactate, lactate was associated with a 2.34 increased odds of admission to the ICU in women with suspected sepsis either during pregnancy or postpartum period. In the first hour, the effort in septic shock is the rapid use of antibiotics and appropriate resuscitation fluids in a right level care hospitalization. In obstetric Patients with septic shock, the rapid decompensation has been reported in those who died. It has important implications for patients managed in non-tertiary centers and or by physicians in medical ICUs not familiar with the physiology changes in pregnancy. It emphasizes the need for early diagnosis and initiation of aggressive treatment of septic shock in a center familiar with the unique needs of pregnant and postpartum women. For example, the American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists recommends high-intensity ICU physician staffing for this kind of patient. Delay implementing appropriate antimicrobial therapy has been associated with worse outcomes. In a cohort study of more than 2,700 adults admitted with septic shock, the interval between onset of hypotension and administration of effective antibiotics treatment was inversely proportional to survival. Each hour of delay lowered the risk of survival by about 7%. In a population-based case control analysis using data from the UK Obstetric Surveillance System and the UK Confidential Enquiry into Maternal Death, Four factors were included in the final regression model. Women who died were more likely to have never received antibiotics. Three points are very important in this issue. One, the initial choice of antibiotics will be empiric and broad. Two, the choice of antibiotics is guided by the most likely pathogen and the severity of the disease. And three, local patterns of resistance should be accounted. According with the last survival and sepsis campaign, empiric combination therapy using at least two antibiotics of different antimicrobial classes aimed at the most likely bacterial pathogens for the initial management of septic shock. And daily assessment for the escalation of, of antimicrobial therapy in patients with sepsis and septic shock. The 2012 sepsis guidelines strongly recommend protocolized resuscitation with quantitative endpoints, early goal directed therapy. Since that, substantial evolution has occurred in understanding the value of the early goal directed therapy. Three key randomized trials enrolled patients presenting to the emergency department who had sepsis with shock or hypoperfusion. The process promise and arise trials have clearly created substantial uncertainty in how to guide clinicians managing patients with sepsis and septic shock. Taken together, these trials suggest that while early goal directed therapy is safe, it's not superior to usual non protocolized care. Usual care has also evolved since these trials 
to include more aggressive fluid resuscitation. Meta-analysis of individual patient data from the three recent trials was designed prospectively to improve statistical power and explore heterogeneity of treatment effect of early goal directed therapy. The primary outcome of 90-day mortality doesn't change between early goal directed therapy and the three studies. Nevertheless, reverse work permits us to understand the modern process. Start early gift antibiotics, correct hypovolemia, and restore perfusion pressure. And since that time, management of sepsis has changed. In all three studies, patients had early antibiotics plus 30 millimeters per kilogram of intravenous uh, fluids prior to randomization. For the reason, surviving sepsis campaign recommend resuscitation from sepsis induced hypoperfusion at least 30 milliliters per kilogram of intravenous crystalloid fluid be given within the first three hours. And follow initial uh, resuscitation, additional fluids be guided by frequent reassessment of hemodynamic status. Crystalloids are the fluid of choice for initial resuscitation of subsequent intravascular volume replacement and we can use albumin in addition to crystalloids when patients require substantial amounts of crystalloids. The message in the first three hours is early vasopressors. The campaign suggests initial target mean arterial pressure of 65 millimeters of mercury in patients with septic shock requiring vasopressor because the evidence has demonstrated that survival doesn't change with highest endpoint. Other important points are norepinephrine as the first choice vasopressors, and they suggest dynamic over static variables be used to predict fluid responsiveness where available. Resuscitation to normalize lactate in patients with elevated lactate levels as a marker of tissue hypoperfusion. Although the usual recommendation is a mean arterial pressure target of 65, this will often be too high for a previously healthy young patient and is almost certainly too high in pregnancy. Fortunately, many pregnant patients have another measure of perfusion readily available in the form of the fetal heart rate tracing. This is sensitive to placental perfusion. Norepinephrine has been used to maintain blood pressure under regional anesthesia for cesarean delivery at at least uh, a low dose seems to be safe. Safety profiles come from a dual perfused single cotidolone model of human placenta and did not affect perfusion of the fetal height. The clinician should not hesitate to administer norepinephrine for a patient with septic shock during pregnancy. In the, in the study of patients with sepsis and septic shock in the New York State Department Health, multilevel models were used to assess the association between the time until completion of the three hour bundle and risk adjusted mortality. More rapid completion of the three hour bundle of sepsis care and rapid use of administration of antibiotics were associated with lower risk adjusted mortality, but not the rapid completion of an initial ball of intravenous fluid. Finally, in the first six hours, it's very important to define source control. Many cases of obstetric sepsis are amenable to source control because the source can be often identified and is often accessible to drainage or evacuation. Source control is especially crucial in septic abortion, and patients who are still pregnant have more risk of spontaneous preterm birth and potential need for delivery as a component of therapy. The end of pregnancy depends on many factors, and for us, cesarean delivery is not routinely indicated and should be reserved for usual obstetric indications. I hope we can contribute to improve the health of our women so they can enjoy a beautiful life with their kids like me. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. You covered a lot of information in that short time. We are grateful for that. 
we have time for a, a few questions. Uh, so the first question relates to lactate measurement. So this is clearly a very important part of the way that you manage uh, your patients. And the question relates to its role in uh, very poor settings where it may not be possible to do uh, lactate measurements. Uh, what would be your approach in that setting? Um, yes, we know that in many uh, middle and low income countries there is a problem with access to that measurement. But um, one thing is uh, probably with the study that we will begin very soon, uh, we will find other uh, possibilities with the clinical findings, but uh, the, in other kind of patients, the clinical findings is not enough to be sure about the, how critical is your patient. And other option is try to move all these resources and economic resources to obtain um, a test. It's a more safe test uh, in a um, not so expensive like the actual text that is probably one of the conditions why we don't have the option in many low resource hospitals. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Uh, there is a question that, or, or comment rather, that early goal directed therapy, uh, the available evidence didn't really demonstrate any uncertainty, but it uh, showed the uh, its, its failings very clearly. Um, what's your uh, view on that, please? Um, the um, early goals directed therapy probably moved the world to other direction in resuscitation abundance or in resuscitation treatment. And the thing is that all the three studies after the early goal directed therapy, that is the reverse work, uh, used the um, best approach in fluid resuscitation and the early treatment with antibiotics. And that's the one support uh, in the evidence that why I, we have all these kind of difference Be because uh, the move change after this study and um, probably this is one of the reasons. Thank you so much, Maria. We will stop there, but there are questions coming in at the moment, so I very much hope that you will be able to stay on uh, to ad address some of those later on in the, uh, in the day. Uh, so we will move on to the next talk, the fourth one, uh, and this relates to some exciting work that Mercedes Bonnet at WHO is uh, doing. So this relates to the Global Maternal Sepsis Study. Uh, Mercedes is a uh, perinatal health epidemiologist based in the Department of Reproductive Health and Research at the World Health Organization. She has extensive experience in global health with a particular interest in maternal and neonatal infections care during childbirth, breastfeeding practices, and very premature babies. Uh, Mercedes is currently leading uh, a global study to assess the burden and the management of uh, potential severe maternal infections and sepsis in uh, healthcare facilities. Over to you, Mercedes. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I will present you the Global Maternal Sepsis Study and Awareness Campaign. And this is the first research activity under the umbrella of the Maternal and Neonatal Sepsis Initiative, launched by uh, WHO, Japaigo, and other partners last year. And as we started our work around maternal uh, sepsis, one of the first problems we were facing uh, was that the burden and of maternal sepsis is not very well known. And the main reason was the absence of a standard definition and robust criteria to identify this condition. As you may know, WHO proposed a new definition of maternal sepsis, which is in line with the current definition of sepsis for the general adult population, 
I'm considering the whole spectrum of pregnancy from uh, early pregnancy to the postpartum or the post-abortion period. Uh, but now this definition of maternal sepsis needs to be applied and validated, and this is the main objective of the GLOSS study. In addition, current tools uh, used in the obstetric population and know as the early warning scores or other seems to perform poorly in predicting risks of developing maternal sepsis or in identifying women who may require critical care due to infections. These tools have other limitations, as in general, they have not been validated in different populations in low resource settings, uh, to be more specific. And um, they use different variables and cutoff points as trigger for action. Another issue is that we don't know how maternal sepsis is managed, especially in low and middle income countries. We don't know uh, if people are implementing a specific protocols using bundles of care uh, proposed for the general adult population and whether these management strategies are effective uh, for maternal sepsis. And finally, in some settings, the lack of awareness of the risk of sepsis and of effective strategies to improve care of women with sepsis are an important barrier to improve maternal, but also neonatal outcomes. So the Global Maternal Sepsis Study was set to develop and validate two sets of criteria for identification of possible severe maternal infections, the presumed maternal sepsis cases, and to develop and validate criteria to identify the confirmed maternal sepsis. We also uh, would like to assess the frequency and the outcomes of maternal sepsis in developing in de undeveloped countries, and to assess the frequency of use of a core set of practices recommended for the prevention, early identification, and management of maternal sepsis. The secondary objectives are to contribute to the understanding of vertical transmission of bacterial infection by assessing outcomes and management of neonates born to mothers with suspected or confirmed infections. And lastly, to explore the level of awareness about maternal and neonatal sepsis among healthcare providers, policymakers, and general public, including pregnant women, mothers, and their families. This study uh, is based on the premise that inpatient management is the optimal treatment for women with sepsis. And in this sense, the health facility is uh, the place where those women will be uh, treated for complications of infections during pregnancy, the intrapartum period, or postpartum post-abortion period, even in places with low coverage of institutional birth. The identification of cases and data collection will be prospective, so we will have comparable data and indicators across all the facilities and countries which will participate in this study. And this will also allow us to collect early clinical indicators of severity, clinical science, laboratory tests, but also other measurements such as lactate or pulse oximetry if they are available from the medical records and routinely perform in the facilities participating in the study. We will include cases over a week, and this will minimize the variability of events across the days of a week, giving variations in maternity unit activities, for example, planet induction or cesarean section certain days of the, of the week, or uh, less staff during the weekend. And because some women won't return to the maternity unit where they give birth if they have a complication after discharge from hospital, and sometimes may not go to an obstetric uh, unit, we uh, 
aimed to cover all facilities where women could be admitted to maximize identification of eligible cases, and in particular, those during the postpartum uh, period. Um, massive uh, data collection effort will take place to recruit women presenting with infection morbidities during one week between November 28 and December 4 this year in hundreds of health facilities across 54 countries across all the regions of the world, of the world, the Americas, Africa, the Eastern Mediterranean, Europe, Southeast Asia, and the Western Pacific. In each country, one geographical area with about 2 million inhabitants will participate in the survey. In each of the participating geographical areas, all health facilities where eligible women could be admitted will be uh, included in the study. And before the study, an awareness campaign targeting healthcare providers will be deployed in these uh, participating facilities. The campaign will have providers to identify and treat women at risk of developing sepsis. Having this large um, sample and including a lot of healthcare facilities have several advantages. Given the relative low frequency of maternal sepsis at the individual facilities, a large collaborative network of facilities may ensure an adequate sample site and also the applicability of our findings to other populations. By expanding the geographical variability, we will be able to cover different organization of the health system and also limit the effect of geographical or seasonal clusters of infection morbidity. This will also help us to reduce the burden of that collection and cost in each country and also in each health facility. But uh, having this large network of facilities will also uh, provide us the opportunity to reach out more healthcare providers with the awareness campaign that we will implement before this study. So how are we going to identify women uh, for this study? Uh, they have to present with any suspected of confirmed clinical infection as uh, reported by the clinicians during the current hospital stay, that can be a primary admission or a readmission, with or without organ dysfunction. She could also present any clinical signs suggestive of infection. Uh, there could be a request for any body fluid culture or swabs. Uh, she could be receiving non-prophylactic uh, antibiotics. Uh, could have any healthcare associated infection, for example, a gun infection, uh, can have an unexplained organ dysfunction uh, by other conditions such as MRH, for example, and any maternal death at admission or during hospital that could be aggravated by a suspected or confirmed infection. We will also collect information on all babies born to uh, included women. By doing this, we will be covering uh, the infections as the underlying cause or as a contributing cause of morbidity and uh, maternal mortality. Once we have identified those women, we will follow them up until discharge from hospital, the 42 days postpartum post-abortion or death, whichever occurs first, and the babies will be followed up uh, for the first week of life, discharge or death, even if they are transferred to another facility in the same geographical area.
this uh, study will allow us to include around 2,800 women presenting maternal infections, and this is applying um, a birth rate uh, at the global level of 19 and using an estimation of 7% of uh, infections in this population. The outputs of this study. Uh, we will have a good assessment of the frequency of maternal sepsis. We will be able to test uh, the identification criteria, which could be applicable in low resource settings for two different um, states of the condition to identify women with possible severe infections that will allow clinicians to trigger action, uh, for example, uh, a bundle of care specific to maternal sepsis, and also to identify the confirmed cases of maternal sepsis to be recorded. Uh, and reported at the facility level. We will also be uh, able to have an assessment of the frequency of early neonatal sepsis among babies born to mothers with peripartum infection, and also how those women are currently managed uh, in the facilities. The materials of the awareness campaign will be also available to be used in other hospitals outside uh, the, the study. And at the end, we will have an active network of health facilities and researchers ready to contribute to the reduction of death due to infections uh, in, the, in mothers and babies. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the funders of the study and a special thanks to all the people in the ground who are making this study possible, especially our country coordinators and the healthcare facilities participating in the study. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mercedes, uh, for sharing this very exciting work that, that is to, to come um, very soon. Uh, one of the audience members has uh, summed it up very nicely where uh, he mentioned that the challenges are great but a great deal of learning can occur in this week. Um, so I think that, that sums it up. Uh, we have time for one question. So the question is, uh, in terms of trying to achieve coverage, um, would there be difficulties in private sector hospitals um, uh, so that you can have a, a true representation of um, sepsis morbidity? Yes. So. Um that's why we are uh, focusing on a geographical area to be able to capture uh, the whole spectrum of uh, cases that could be admitted in different facilities and also those women who will be transferred from one facility to the other. Uh, it is true that uh, by focusing on the health facilities, we will uh, mainly have the more severe cases and that we will probably lose uh, the less severe cases or those that or women who die before arriving uh, to a referral uh, facility. Thank you so much, Mercedes. And again, we hope that you would be able to stay on for the discussions at the end of the session. So that takes us to the final talk of the second session um, of this conference. And this final talk is on addressing maternal sepsis in low and middle income countries. And this talk will be given by uh, Jeffrey Smith, Dr. Jeffrey Smith from Japago in the United States. So Dr. Jeffrey Smith um, is an obstetrician and gynecologist and a public health practitioner with over 25 years of clinical and public health experience in developing countries across Asia, Africa, and Latin America. 
He works for Japaigo as the vice president for technical leadership, uh, and that is based in Baltimore. And until recently, was also the maternal health team leader at the USAID supported maternal and child survival program uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, he is also assistant professor of gynecology and obstetrics at the John Hopkins University School of Medicine. Uh, over to you, Jeff. Great. Thank you very much, Ari. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. So I would like to take this opportunity to reflect a bit on the situation of maternal inspection and resources in the city setting, and especially looking at some of the policy and the program dynamics about this when we look to make changes and support our colleagues around the world. Um, I will look briefly at what we know regarding policy and practice, um, where are some of the gaps in low and middle income countries where there are some under two opportunities, and what is currently under development in the programmatic realm. So I think all of the previous speakers have related the challenges of maternal mortality and the contribution of justice to that. In a very uh, interesting panel that I was on at the FIGO conference in 2015, there were two presentations, one by a colleague from Rwanda and another by a colleague from Uganda, who had said because of their concerted efforts over years to address causes of mortality such as hemorrhage and preeclampsia, sepsis and infectious morbidity had become the number one cause of mortality, at maternal mortality at their facility. So we have a situation where a, a lot of attention has gone to other causes of maternal mortality over the years, and we must, as a global community, turn our attention towards infection. We at Chapaigo conducted a literature review in 2015 looking at causes of infection and also what were the programmatic and uh, policy approaches to addressing that. And that we found, first of all, a, a sharp um, lack of specific literature from developing uh, and low-middle income countries. That's why I think the, the study that is currently underway, as described by Dr. Bornet a moment ago, is really critical to our field. Also, what was noted in this literature review was that there was a real difference in terms of the cause of infection um, or the perception of the cause of infection between high-income countries, where people believe prolonged labor and prolonged rupture of membranes was the cause, and in lower-middle-income countries, where the cause was thought to be hygiene of the facility, hand hygiene, and women's hygiene specifically. So I think this, this current study that's underway um, is useful for us in, in terms of understanding the etiology. Uh, if we look at the situation of maternal infection among many different countries and the current, the efforts being made globally to address maternal health, we find that many of the strategies of bringing women into facilities for uh, skilled attendance at delivery may contribute to increasing infection. Many facilities do not have uh, proper infection prevention protocols. Movement into facilities may increase cesarean section rates, which contributes to infection. The crowding in facilities and the lack of sufficient staff uh, may also contribute. And there may be, uh, because of crowding, women may choose to go home early, and that early discharge may result in diagnosis after leaving the facility. And the, the response to infection in recent years has really been limited. We have no great new innovations in this area. There are no new drugs or antibiotics that are widely available, no protocols. And I think this is against the, uh, the rising rates, which I described previously. 
Uh, through the maternal and child survival program uh, several years ago, we looked at policies and practices across multiple different countries. And we noted that in uh, across 20 different countries, in mostly in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, uh, we looked at the policy of whether or not prophylactic antibiotics were routinely recommended before manual removal of placenta. And only in 60% of those countries was that the case in national norms and standards. The same uh, similar data was found for looking at the use of prophylactic antibiotics before cesarean section. 70% of the countries had policies and, and guidelines for recommendation of prophylactic antibiotics, but 30% of countries did not have that as a policy within their national guidelines. We also, across five different countries in East and Southern Africa, did direct clinical observation regarding infection prevention practices. And in, across two, more than 2,000 direct observations of clinical care, we saw that the majority of, in the majority of situations, Providers did not wash their hands before examination or before uh, examination during the first stage. Where While they did wear gloves or put on protective equipment, there was not a routine use of good infection prevention practices across all these facilities and in all these clinical situations, which reminds us that we have to not only be looking at in diagnosis and management of infection, we also need to think about preventative practices. So what is the current situation regarding maternal infection? We have guidelines that do have appropriate recommendations regarding use of antibiotics, but they're not always specific and they are inconsistently followed. And in general, Country programs have prioritized addressing other causes of maternal mortality and morbidity, and therefore there has not been much priority placed on addressing maternal infection. Antibiotic use in some situations, it, it is overused or on in use of an indicated antibiotics, and in other situations, inappropriate use or wrong use of antibiotics. So we have to work harder to address both the prevention and management. From a program point of view, when we think about typical constellations of interventions, such as basic emergency obstetric care and comprehensive emergency obstetric care, we have to ask ourselves, where is the management of maternal sepsis in these packages? I think we have to recognize that Concentrated uh, capacity building in the management of maternal sepsis has not typically been part of either one of these packages. So as we learn more following this week's data collection that Mercedes described, I think we have to revisit the approaches that we take uh, programmatically and in terms of policy in countries around the world. What are the opportunities for improvement in this area? WHO and many implementing partners have recently turned greater attention towards the quality of care, not only for intrapartum care, but during antenatal and postnatal care. And therefore, we should join that global effort on addressing quality of care and begin to build stronger infection prevention and management strategies across the pregnancy continuum. In terms of prevention, we should look at the antenatal period as an opportunity to optimize women's health, identify potential infections, and address those infections so that women enter labor without risk factors that increase their possibility of intrapartum infection. We should put an emphasis on earlier diagnosis of infection and earlier diagnoses of possible sepsis, as noted by previous speakers. And I think we should begin to look much more critically at treatment options. 
the current treatment options that are recommended in the managing pregnancy and uh, in uh, managing complications in pregnancy and childbirth manual talk about a three drug regimen using ampicillin, gentamitis, gentamicin, or clindamycin and metronidazole, all being intravenous drugs with different dosing intervals, which means that the current recommendations require the administration of three different drugs across eight different periods. This is a challenge for nurses working in the postpartum domain and postpartum ward having to care for many patients. And if we look at our colleagues in the newborn field, they have been working to simplify and improve the approaches that they're taking to infection prevention and management. There is current work underway in a program that we have initiated uh, to address post-cesarean infection by working on a package of interventions, prophylactic, including prophylactic antibiotics prior to cesarean infection, appropriate abdominal skin preparation, vaginal wash using chlorhexidine, proper tissue oxygenation, and then good surgical technique and asepsis. Using this package and an audit and feedback cycle, we hope to be able to drive down post-cesarean infection rates across a group of 40 hospitals in Western Tanzania. And so we will report on these results in the coming year. Finally, what should we be doing when we think about uh, addressing program approaches to managing sepsis? We have to support the dissemination of the new sepsis definition. That definition simplifies and makes it easier for providers to identify and respond early to sepsis. We have to support colleagues uh, such as Dr. Lissauer and the work on development and testing of bundles for addressing sepsis. And we need to be, begin to use more team-based approaches to, to aggressively approach situations where sepsis is suspected. We certainly need greater innovation uh, for diagnostics, for management protocols, and for simplified treatment. But together, I think as we put greater emphasis on addressing maternal infection, maternal sepsis, and early newborn infection, together as a programmatic community, I believe that we can make a big impact in this continuing cause of maternal morbidity and mortality. So I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to hearing additional comments regarding how we move the maternal infection agenda forward. Thank you very much, Jeff. That was a, a wonderful summary uh, at the end of your presentation. Um, and um, you, you've also laid out the, um, uh, the steps for moving forward there. Uh, thank you for doing that. Um, this uh, allows us to um, uh, take, it takes us to the general discussion uh, session. But before we move on to that, Jeff, if I may ask you a, a question that has been put forward by one of the audience members. Um, what, what is the, uh, is there a tension uh, in focusing on one uh, subject area such as sepsis um, and, you know, its impact on uh, overall quality improvement and other conditions? That's a great question, Ari. I think uh, we as a global community have to begin to identify new techniques and approaches that can be added to a broad package of management strategies for all causes of maternal mortality. I think that the uh, attention on sepsis should not mean that we should decrease our focus on uh, other causes of maternal mortality so that we're really adding new approaches and new um, responses and innovation to a broad package to improve the quality of care. I think we've seen in a number of countries that if we simply encourage women to come to facilities for assisted for uh, build attendance at delivery, but we don't address quality of care comprehensively, we won't achieve the gains in mortality reduction that we see. 
Sure. Thank you so much, Jeff. So that um, allows us to move on to the discussion uh, session. Now, this will be brief. We've, in fact, got nine minutes uh, to have a discussion. So uh, I believe that all the speakers are on the line at the moment. Uh, so I'll pick out some questions that have been coming through uh, over the over this session, and I put it to uh, to, to uh, uh, all of you. Uh, so the first uh, relates to um, innovations. Uh, there are quite a few questions on that. Um, could perhaps uh, David comment on what you think would be key innovations uh, moving forward? Hi, thanks, Harry. Yeah, I, I think that there's potential for innovation in a number of domains, um, and I think we've heard reference to some of these already. I think some of the areas around improved sepsis detection, um, uh, innovation to enable wider use of existing technologies like pulse oximetry and uh, bedside lactate measurement, um, and also making existing devices um, more robust, easier to use so that routine observations are carried out um, more reliably and consistently. But I also think there's a lot of potential for innovation around the way we um, uh, implement existing guidelines and with you know innovative quality improvement approaches to make it easier for um, practitioners on the ground um, to identify um, sepsis and manage it appropriately. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure others may have uh, additional thoughts. Okay. Um, th there are a number of um, uh, uh, quite specific questions, and, you know, uh, uh, I'm happy for any one of you to tackle this. Um, is there any evidence for the use of procalcitonin to help start or stop antibiotic treatment in maternal sepsis? I'm not sure if anyone else does. I don't know of any specific evidence in maternal sepsis, I'm afraid. Okay. Uh, and what about the role of shock index uh, as a tool uh, for early diagnosis of maternal sepsis? Another question. I can take the shock index uh, question. Mm -hmm. This is uh, Jean-Paulo Souza from uh, WHO. Uh, the shock index, uh, from what we have seen in the work on, on postpartum hemorrhage, uh, seems to be a promising uh, indicator. Uh, and we will certainly uh, test this as a potential predictor of maternal sepsis and possible severe maternal infections as part of the uh, study that uh, we discussed before, the GLOSS study. Um, there are, we, we need to do further research and to determine its value for maternal sepsis particularly. And I think we will achieve that in the next couple of months. Thank you. Thank you, uh, JP. So there is a question for for Maria, um, what is the role of vasopressin uh, to maintain uh, mean arterial pressure? Uh, so that's one of the questions from the audience. Um, hello, thank you. Uh, the role of vasopressin pressure is try to maintain the adequate mean arterial pressure to perfusion, and the endpoint used in the mostly of the studies is the 65 millimeters of mercury and there is a special study that proves that it's a very good uh, endpoint because later uh, higher uh, or highest uh, endpoint doesn't work in ter in terms of in mortality uh, there is not a special study uh, with the use of vasopressor in septic shock during pregnancy. And that's the reason why uh, many studies in pregnant population suggest, suggest the use of the fetal heart racing like other indicators or maternal perfusion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, a question to Jeff. Um, so we appreciate how important hand washing and infection prevention is, but even when 
soap and water is available, uh, the uptake of it seems to be um, limited. Uh, what, what insights can you share from the field to improve it? Thank you. Um, I, I think quality improvement approaches, uh, there are a number of different methodologies and, and techniques for addressing quality improvement approaches. Um, and hand washing is one of the uh, techniques that is really been highlighted for addressing prevention of infection. Making it easy, making it uh, routine, allowing other members of the staff to support uh, other team members and encouraging people to comment to their colleagues about the need for additional hand washing are all approaches that have been taken into account. The other, um, as I noted, one of the approaches, which is audit and feedback of tracking certain data, be it uh, infection rates or postpartum infection rates, as a way for uh, wards or facilities to know their specific rates have been useful in helping uh, teams to address behaviors needed to reduce infection. Great. Thank you, Jeff. We've got only a few minutes. So a final question to Mercedes. Uh, Mercedes, um, it is expected that your study will produce lots of exciting findings. What do you hope to do with it moving forward? So I think uh, the main outcome of the study will be on helping people to better uh, identify those women at risk of developing uh, sepsis and being able to use, uh, for example, the bundle that uh, David uh, presented or any other package of, of interventions. Uh, we will also have uh, data on uh, antimicrobial resistance, for example, that we will also use uh, here in the organization to uh, move forward uh, this um, issue. Um, Great. Thank you, Mercedes. So uh, we've had um, a set of wonderful presentations, uh, truly tremendous, uh, and, and the discussions have been very helpful. So I would like to thank all the speakers for sharing your knowledge uh, and, and time with us. Uh, I would also like to thank our sponsors and, of course, the organizers, uh, Global Sepsis Alliance and the World Health Organization for uh, putting this together, which has been a, uh, a great uh, uh, conference so far. Uh, but finally, and importantly, of course, the, the audience, thank you so much for, for joining us. There are more than 7,000 of you uh, from over 100 countries uh, online at the moment, uh, and I think that is truly, uh, truly wonderful. Uh, we really appreciate this. We hope that you found uh, the discussions and the, the talks useful. Uh, please do uh, take this further, uh, have discussions about what you heard with your colleagues and team, and do ponder over what it means to you and to your team, uh, and how this may be uh, taken to your practice uh, to improve outcomes. So I think we will conclude there. Uh, so in a few minutes, we will have the, the next uh, session, which will be on the, on the crucial subject of neonatal sepsis, an exciting lineup there. So please stay on uh, for that session. But for now, I, I will thank you and, and say goodbye. Thank you.